So, Professor Green, you are welcome to our institute, UPSIFS Lucknow. Thank you for inviting me. And as the founding director, I am grateful for your taking out time. Although you have a very tight and busy schedule being in India. Well, you have given a very elaborated lecture today in our institute and the institute, institute get benefited. I have certain questions because you are the globally recognized expert. So, how do you feel that in the country like India, the population is very high, the rate of crime is also significant, rape cases are particularly creating lot of you know unrest in the mind of the people. So, how do you see that forensic science can advance justice in such rape incidents or heinous crime particularly? Well, I think anything that, that expands the, the, the use of forensic science, um, particularly to target those particular types of crime, because <clears throat> when our database was launched way back uh, in the day, 19, 1995, uh, it was put forward on the basis that it would be really useful for what we referred to at the time as crimes against the person. So DNA in particular um, is very useful and very uh, probative in terms of those, those cases. So um, it it's, can often be the, the, the proof um, that actually proves the case or, or will enable the case to be taken forward. Um, so at the moment you don't have a database. Uh, but that will be the next, I think that is going to be the next step uh, when you've actually got this database uh, and with a country like India, um, you know, the, the population and, and the, the people who commit crime, you, can, you will be able to model the, the contribution that forensic science ought to make uh, you know, based on the, you know, the turnaround of your DNA, on you know, how many DNA matches are made and so forth. So I think it has the, the potential to make the, the, a real, real inf uh, difference. Um, yeah, I think the words I use in on the stage were revolutionise. Uh, yes. I think it will revolutionise, um, but it will need a lot of understanding as you move through this this process. Uh, if it's not to become a a, a tool that's misinterpreted, uh, that then becomes uh, <coughs> you know um, di distrusted. Um, so we actually need to take lots of people on this journey with us. So it won't be just about the, the police service. It won't just be about the forensic science services. Uh, or the judiciary, but it will be everyone working together with the lawyers and trying to get this thing good. As you rightly mentioned, Professor Green, <coughs> that data bank is very important, right? But you see, the previous issue, particularly in constructing DNA database, are very particular. I just want to know, because you are since beginning, you might be participating in policy making also, Suppose any country like India wish to develop DNA database, what are the steps you suggest to build up the DNA database? I think the first thing that, that we did was to work on the legislation. Um, so I, I suppose in a sense, leave the science to, to last. It, it's the, the science is often the, the easy bit to sort out. The, the hard bits are the legislation, um, the decide upon the sample, who you're going to sample from, uh, decide whether the, the your sampling is going to be retrospective to start with. So are you going to take some back cases? Um, so, yeah, that's, those are the things I would start with. Um, I'd leave the, the science to last because often the, the science will, will work. Um, I would be using the, the notion of what could be achieved uh, with this database to actually introduce, you know, introduce that into the minds of politicians. Um, what else would I say? I'd say that I would have some metrics of success. So if someone comes to you in a few weeks time and says, actually, what, what does success look like? You have this vision of this is what I'm, this is what we're doing, why we're doing it. Because, you know, this, the science is very, very effective to, uh, against these particular crimes. But what is often not so effective is the understanding and uh, all, all the, the practical issues that fall out beyond, beyond the science. Yeah. One more question, very pertinent we are facing in India, the delay in trial lot many cases are pending in the courtroom. So do you have any solution through forensic science so that the trial may be expedited and the conviction rate or you can say the justice system may be improved? Well, well one of the things we found um, repeatedly was that when, ch when faced with 
DNA, um, very often the suspects, the offenders, the, the culprits you might call them, um, plead guilty. They plead guilty when they're faced with this overwhelming evidence, so it reduces the demand on, on the courts. I'm not going to say it eliminates it, it doesn't, but uh, some people, when, when faced with this evidence, uh, will, will not go to trial. They, they'll plead guilty, um, and that not only saves court time, but it also saves the victim the, the trauma of actually going into court and reliving this whole experience o over again. So hidden benefits there, really. So and you of course, mean? The, you know, the, the cost of a court trial as well. You know, if some people are, if they, could, if they plead guilty, then we don't have to you know, panel the jury, we don't have to... Uh, so you raise a very important question and our new laws, criminal laws which have been introduced yeah. by government of India recently, it has also given a lot of emphasis. So this is a very good point. Professor Green, you said that if we conduct DNA and suppose DNA is positive, so the, the accused will prefer to go for guilty plea and things like that. Yeah. So I think it will expedite the process. It's a very good point. Sure. Uh, but of course, you know, there will be, the, will be challenges and as, as, as is their right, the, the, the defendants will have the chance, the, the option of challenging that, that, in, that information, that challenging the... That's very right. Very often one of the, the, the defences put forward is one of consent. Uh, and as we were just saying in our lecture there, you know, the, the transfer of DNA or, or not uh, really doesn't prove whether the offence happened. Um, so I think we need to get that into people's minds that just because you know, DNA has been transferred, it could have been from a previous occasion. Um, it could have been from a consensual act. Um, one more thing is very pertinent these days, that role of AI and modern technology in, in cyberspace and others. How you think that these you know, emerging technologies may be useful in the field of forensic science? I think I'm a big advocate of AI. I, I, I'm not one who would want to uh, dissuade it. I mean, I don't think it will ever replace the, the final check from that human individual to say this is either a match or it isn't. Um, but if you look at the, you know, the, the matching algorithms on fingerprint databases, for example, you know, they, they've got much, much better over the years. Um, effectively, by the use of the advanced algorithms, uh, aka uh, artificial intelligence. So I, I, I think providing the, you have the, the sort of final checks and balances by the, the, the individual, uh, by the expert, um, then I don't see any reason why we shouldn't get, maximize the contribution, you know, really squeeze everything we possibly can out of uh, forensic science. And if that means using some, um, some artificial intelligence to, to help us to get to the uh, solution. Uh, personally, I don't see a problem, providing it's checked with the, uh, the, the human eye. One more issue, which I want your response, Professor Green. What do you suggest, like country, like developing country we have? We have very aspirational population, right? And people have great faith in judicial system. And how do you think that country like India should move ahead in the field of forensic science? Can you give certain steps in brief so that this science can do better society and justice? I think you've actually made the first step. Again, in, in my presentation this morning, I told you where we were in the 1980s, uh, where there was very little emphasis on forensic science. The majority of cases were taken forward by what you might call traditional means. Um, that evolved and that is for the good. So that, that's really, I think that's the first step that you, you're making. You, you're actually mandating now that these cases will be examined, uh, whereas previously they wouldn't. Um, so that's the, that, that's the number of things. That gives vi victims uh, hope. Um, it gives them some sense that actually, you know, their cases are being taken seriously. Um, and so it is really that, that sort of first step. Uh, but I think it can only be for the good, providing, of course, we take institutions like yours along with us, you know, so we instill in the minds of professionals what they have to do to each step of the process. Because as I said previously, the, the science will often work. You almost forget the science. It's, it's very, very well laid out, it, it works. What doesn't often work is all the, the misunderstanding, the misinterpretation, uh, and, you know, the, the, the fact that, for example, you know, if, if we start to make you know, some errors, some miscarriages of justice, um, the whole thing will implode, it starts to you know, be distrusted, uh, and then people, well, they just start to dis distrust the, the sciences. Yes. One more issue which actually India 
wish to examine is the innocence claims. You might be well established, established forensic expert that wrongful conviction is a challenge globally, right? And no jurisdiction can claim that there is no problem of wrongful conviction, only extent may vary. So, how do you see that forensic science may raise ray of hope in those people who may be either uh, convicted or may have been wrongly alleged? So, it gives that ray of hope to people who have been uh, falsely identified. Uh, you know, we, we, we've just been dealing with it, looking at the case of Brandon Mayfield. Um, you, you do actually need someone who, from the defence, who can say, uh, you know, this is not correct. So I, I, I think this scope really for, you know, for the defence bar, for the defence lawyers, uh, for the defence forensic science services to develop alongside to actually challenge the, uh, you know, those those views. So for people who perhaps have been falsely accused, um, I think it would be it's good to have those sort of checks and balances. Um, I think working towards a, a sort of common standard within the, the laboratory and a common standard of investigation. So not just about the science, uh, managing the quality of the science, but actually what do we, what do we need to do with the science once we've, we've got it? Uh, and how do, we, what, how do we collect it to start with? What, what crimes will we attend? Uh, where will we store it? How will it be transported? Uh, how will it be reported? Uh, lots and lots and lots of things uh, along the way. So this is not, you know, it's not something that can be done overnight. Uh, but it's one major step in the way. You've, you've got legislation in place. Uh, now the thing is now to make sure that we enact it and enact, in, enact it in a way that's, you know, that's just. Well, at the end, Professor Green, our institute, Uttar Pradesh State Institute of Forensic Science, Lucknow, is a very, you know, fascinating to build world-class education in this field. So what is your message to our institute? You have seen other institute in the country. So what message you wish to provide to our students, our faculty, and what is your vision for our institute to build up? Well, I hope it grows. I know it, I can see that it will grow. I, I know it will grow because forensic science is, is, very, is a very, very popular way um, of teaching science, even for those students who actually don't go into work in forensic science. It's a good way of actually getting them interested in science. Um, I think getting these young students then, in, you know, in, in, into in, employable, getting them students into jobs um, where they can then start to you know, develop these, their, their connections. They can then start to develop their, their techniques, uh, their, their value. Uh, and um, I think, as I said in the, in the lecture there. there were, you know, in, 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 infest the, these organisations. You know, let's get some of these people in the Indian police service. Let's get them employed in, 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 the, in the law sector. You know, what's better than a police officer who actually knows science? What's better than a lawyer that actually knows science? You know, so uh, that's what I would like to see for, for this institution. And I really do like your idea of, you know, law and lab. Um, I like it so much that I wish I'd have thought of it. So you appreciate this. Can you just give some more idea on Law with Labs, this caption we have introduced here? Oh. On la Law with Labs? Well, I, th I think it, it bridges that gap, doesn't it? It bridges the gap between you know, what, what ha happens when one part of the process stops and the, the next part starts. I mean, we, one of the projects that we dealt with at home was uh, looking at the, you know, how this, this whole process worked. And we, we visited all the police services in the UK um, and we found that if you want to look for what we referred to in those, term, days, those days as performance leaks, where, you know, when the, the baton was dropped, it was in the handoff from one organisation to another. So when the, the, the scientific, scientific people gave it to the police, there was a drop off, you know, some of the batons were dropped. When the police gave it to the lawyers, some of the batons were dropped. So I remember one of the consultants telling us at the time, if you want to look for a performance leak, look in the handoff from one body to another. And so I think the more we can actually smooth that out with, with knowledge sharing amongst the, the two uh, and with, with proper checking. Uh, and I'd say, you know, make sure that you have some proper metrics. Uh, so when you're challenged about actually, you know, is this adding value? You know, you can give them the metrics. You can give them you know, the impact it's had on victims. You can have some victims who've uh, um, 
you know, we've been a success, success stories. Um, we certainly did with our programmes. We would, would often get victims to come and tell us what, what it meant for them. Uh, but I think the fact that, you know, that, that a victim in, in India you know, might now be able to get some closure because, you know, they might have their case examined uh, and solved uh, is great. Um, and I think, you know, the, what that means really to, um, you know, to, to people who might be re repeat victimised. Uh, because you know these violent sexual criminals, they don't stop with one. They don't stop with one offence. You know, they, the, the more they actually, you know, the more they, they uh, get away with it, the more they do. Uh, and I think the more tools we can actually give to, you know, professional chief police officers, um, then I think that has to be for the four. And, and I, the, the final thing I would say is, is that this science will be driven. Truly, it will be driven by senior police officers. Um, people who are visionary, who, who actually know what the science can do, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll push this forward. Uh, because, so they're, they're, for me, they're the catalyst to a lot of this. So at the last, what is the tagline you want to give to our institute? Any, any words of? I, I, think, I think I would say to them, work hard, um, enjoy it. I've enjoyed every single day of what I've done. I still yes. enjoy it now. Um, and. Uh, if, if you enjoy it, uh, it doesn't become a, a trouble. It only becomes a trouble if you're actually not enjoying your studies. Yeah. Think laterally, think critically. I think if we were to say to one, one of them, any student, by the time you leave this institution, you should be able to think critically. You should be a changed person um, because you, your mind would think in a different way than it did when you first came through the doors as a fresher. Very true. Thank, Thank you very much, my, my pleasure. Professor Green. Thank you once Thank again. You. Thank and you. I am really appreciating as founding director to spare time for us. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.